Good morning. It's great to be with you again on this Sunday morning. And I'll say again, as you've probably heard several million times, Happy New Year. We uh, anticipate that 2021 will be a better year than 2020 uh, and that every succeeding year will get better and better and better, at least for those of us who put our constant faith in him. I want to thank you again for your giving to our Crown of Blessing Fund. We continue to uh, feed the poor and help the destitute in various parts of the world. And, and uh, God is using it uh, as really not only just to minister to people's physical needs, but it is uh, a wide ranging form of evangelism and ministry beyond what we originally anticipated. So thank you for giving as God has directed you. I also want to show you uh, a video, a short video of some of the progress being made with the building that we're involved with in uh, Uganda and uh, let you have an idea of what's happening there. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the video was uh, taken while the person shooting the video was in a boat. So uh, it, uh, <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, I don't know if you can, yeah, there, you get an idea. This is the outside of the building, of course. And uh, the walls are going up, and you can see the next story is is rising. And uh, I don't want you to get seasick, so we, we don't have a, a lengthy video here. But uh, it is a, a large building, and it is going up very rapidly. And we thank God for all the progress. Uh, speaking with Pastor Peter, he was telling me that uh, all of the workers who had not known Christ, have now come to know him, and that the team is working together there in a wonderful way. So let us continue to pray for our brothers and sisters there as they're doing something that everybody said, no, no, it's not the time to build. In fact, uh, the, Peter told me that uh, they're the only ones building in their county, and uh, so uh, uh, they have access to everything they need. Also, I'd like to also uh, make you aware of what you probably would be aware of if you've taken your email, that uh, we start this year with five days of grace, five days of prayer and fasting as we seek the Lord in 2021. And I'd like to encourage you to participate in this as part of the church family. This is a, a water-only fast, if you can do a water-only fast, if you have to work or some other health reason or whatever you can't. Do a water only fast, do your best. Have some soup or broth or uh, eat very lightly, but spend these five days as much as you can in prayer and seeking to the Lord and seeking the Lord and listening to him and receiving from him. Uh, I'll be sending out uh, a prayer track. Uh, so you'll have that uh, before we meet. We'll have these five days starting on Tuesday, going through Saturday evening. It'll start at 7 and go for 40 minutes from 7 to 7.40. We'll be praying in groups and we'll be praying for ourselves and for our families and for the church family and for the nation and the nations and a number of things that uh, we want to stand in the throne of grace and be those that offer petition and declaration and release the grace of God in so many ways throughout the earth. And so let me encourage you to do that. That's Tuesday through Saturday of this week. And you will receive on email a prayer track from me that you can use throughout the day as well as uh, when we gather in the evening, we'll be using the prayer track. So that's a water only fast starting on Tuesday going through Saturday. All right, let's come to the Lord in prayer now as we come to hear God's word for today. Father, thank you for the quickening of the Holy Spirit, Lord, upon every one of us. Lord, the speaker, the listeners, Lord, wherever they may be in the various nations of the world, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear from heaven. And may the Holy Spirit touch bodies and minds and hearts and families and so many ways, Lord, as your word goes forth. 
even as you spoke the word when there was nothing and it went forth and created. Let the word of the Lord be creative today, creating healing and help and insight and growth and change in all of us, myself included, in Jesus' most precious and powerful name. Amen. Well, today I want to entitle my remarks, A New Song for 2021. You know, as we set out in 2021, we, we don't want the backward look. We want a forward look, anticipating God's favor and blessing and breakthrough in every area of our lives and especially in your life, because every breakthrough that God brings to you, you have something to bring to others. And uh, I want to talk today about something that uh, really I think is uh, quite powerful uh, because the Bible says it's powerful, <laughs> not just my opinion. And my life journey has been a discovery uh, more and more and will be uh, about this subject of a song, the song that you have. Because everybody in life has a song, just as God has given us all the capacity of speech. He has also given us, if you can talk, you can, you can sing. Even if you can't uh, talk, you can still talk inside. You can still sing inside. God's given us this capacity. And... It is, I believe, often an undiscovered capacity. I mean, everybody sings at one level or another. And sometimes we don't realize how significant it is. Now, we've talked to you a great deal about how important your speech is. Well, if, if song is a, just another form of speaking uh, that accompanies a melody and a tune, etc., uh, then, of course, it is powerful as well. And so everyone has a song. And everybody sings a song, even if they don't realize it. And so I, I like, just like you to turn to somebody near you and say, hey, what's, what's happened to your song? Where's your song? <laughs> uh, Psalm 77. Psalm 77 and verse 6 says, I call to remembrance my songs in the night. My song in the night. Now, that's kind of an interesting turn of phrase. David says, I, I have a song in the night. Uh, how many of you wake up in the night and just lift your voice and, and just start singing? Uh, probably not so many. <laughs> because that's generally not the time that you uh, are meant to be singing. Uh, but he's really talking not so much about the night time, though that can occur, but a, a season in, in which there is a song that is not ordinarily sung in that kind of season. And so we're in that kind of season. We're in a night season, so to speak, as a nation with all this pandemic and the economy and education and Brexit and all the stuff that's going on. Many people would say we're in a night season. But God says, even through the word here, there is a song in the night. I say, oh, pastor, that was David. He had a song of the night. Well, why do you read the Bible then? If, if the words of David, which are the words given to us, don't apply. They do apply, as, as we'll see more and more. Psalm 6930 says, I will praise the name of God with a song except during lockdown. <laughs> no, no. I will praise the name of God with a song. I'll magnify him, magnify him. So you can have a song that actually magnifies, enlarges, makes greater God in your life, in your experience, in your setting, in your situation, in your circumstances, if you will use the song. I'll magnify him with thanksgiving. You have a, a song of thanksgiving that God has put in your heart. You, you need to sing it. You need to sing it. And so I'd like to look at some, some verses that talk about some of the songs of the Bible. Psalm 40 and verse 3. Psalm 40 verse 3 says, He put a new song in my mouth. So God puts a song in your mouth, and then he puts a new song in your mouth, and then he puts another song, which is a new song, a song you haven't sung before. That's what a new song is. So your whole life journey, there's, there's songs that are there. Even if you don't choose to sing those songs by volition, by an act of your will, 
God has given you a song. If he's given you a song, there's significance to it. If he's given you words, there are, there's significance to those words. And there's power in those words if you capture the significance and you utilize those words and you utilize those songs and those tunes, those melodies, and you sing them, you speak them. Whatever God does, it's powerfully significant. And so it's, it's vital that we need to grasp this mystery of the song just as many people around the world are discovering the value of words. You know, we, we see a world full of words, more words than ever before, and their power to destroy hope and bring despair and discouragement and cynicism and sarcasm and unbelief and, and all those things brought about by words, published in newspapers, on the media, whatever. But words are also powerful because it's by words that you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and God translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and have eternal life by faith and by the confession of your mouth. So songs, which include words, also have this awesome power. And I want us to examine this as we go forward. He says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Psalm 137 and verse 1 says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for our captors asked for songs. This is when Israel was in captivity. They asked the, the Jews, the Israelites, to sing some of your songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. We know about the songs of Zion. They're joyful songs. They're songs of triumph. They're songs of blessing. They're songs of the greatness of God's people. You go ahead and sing some of those. We know you're in captivity. And their answer was, how can we sing? How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? This isn't the place where we're comfortable. That's what it means to be in a foreign land. Right now, lockdown seems like a foreign land. It doesn't seem like a place where that's comfortable at all. How can we sing? How can we sing? How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? You can sing songs, that's for sure. You can sing the blues. A lot of people sing in the blues. Let's go on. Verse 3 in Psalm 137 says, For there our captors asked us for songs. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4 says, How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Job 35 and verse 10 says, No one says, Where is God my maker who gives songs in the night. Well, you know, people don't really need God to give them a song in the day when things are good and, and obvious and clear and wonderful and blessed. And, you know, it can just kind of naturally generate. But here's a God who gives songs in the night. When things do not look clear or positive or wonderful, a song, and there are night songs. And the songs of the night you'll see our songs of thanksgiving and praise and gladness and joy, despite the season. Exodus chapter 15, we have one of the great psalms, songs of the Bible. And this, this uh, particular song comes, as you might well be aware, after Israel crossed the sea. They had such an amazing amazing. Uh, journey getting out of Egypt and and then, you know, being chased by the Philistines, I mean by Pharaoh and his army. And uh, they uh, were in that whole drama. They, they get the most amazing miracle that I think when you get to heaven, you'll, you'll have a chance to talk to them about that whole uh, getting across the Red Sea. And then they saw their enemies swept uh, and drowned in, in, in the waters of the Red Sea. And then chapter 
14 finishes and chapter 15 picks up with the fact that Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. Uh, they, they sang this song, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. And you might say, well, okay, pastor. Yeah, I've read that that uh, passage there in Exodus chapter. I'd encourage you to read that uh, song in Exodus chapter 15, 1 to 13, because you might think that, oh, yeah, well, that's just the song of Moses that's under the, in the Old Testament. It was about a particular kind of event. Uh, and so what's that to do? You will see. That's not the end of the song of Moses at all. And, you know, uh, let's just pick it up again, just so you know I'm not uh, making this up. Uh, Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15 and verse 2 says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had victory over the beast, hmm, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses. Oh, maybe the song of Moses isn't done with. Maybe it isn't just historical data. Maybe it isn't just something of, of interest. Or no, no. The song of Moses, you'll sing again. You'll sing again. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So there's two songs that come together. The song of Moses and the song of the land, uh, the song of the lamb. I don't have time this morning to bring the full sense of these two songs and how they are joined together in a, a chorus that is the, the final triumph of redemption. But these two songs come together and you're going to sing the song of the lamb and the song of Moses. And the words are great. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. So those two songs come together in the climax of redemption. Now, unfortunately, many people only sing aloud their best songs when they're kind of in church services. And those songs are generally songs that have been written by somebody else. And that's not bad. That's good. We should and we do. But a church service service should not be uh, exclusively the only time you sing your songs and your new songs to the Lord. And, you know, it's children should, should actually hear in the house the songs of Zion ascending to the Lord. They should hear you sing from time to time. You know, I was blessed to have... Uh, parents who, who love to sing. And uh, they sang in the car, they sang at home, uh, and they gathered us and we sang. And we, back in the day, we got out the hymnals and we, we sang until we had favorites. And then, okay, what favorite do you want, son? What do you want? And so on and so forth. And, and we lifted songs. And, and today I know many, many songs from lots of different denominations because we we're in lots of different, but I, I know lots of songs that have stayed inside of me because when I was a kid and we sang those songs and the truths, the scriptures, uh, the, the expression, uh, all that stayed with me. And there's not a day goes by where one of those songs doesn't rise up with them in me. And I find myself singing those songs as well. And so you should have a song in your house. Psalm 118 verse 14 says, The Lord is my strength and song. The Lord is my song. The Lord is my song. So when you sing to the Lord, you're releasing back to him a portion of himself. He has become my salvation. Psalm 119 54 says, your decrees, your statutes, your testimonies, your laws are the theme of my song wherever, wherever, wherever. 
you have a song for wherever. You have a song for wherever you are, a song. And you've actually got more songs. You can sing. You can borrow songs from the other realm if you want. There's lots of those, as we'll see in this message. But the song that you need to sing is the one that God put inside of you. You don't need the refrains of this world. And it's important for us to understand that because we all have a song, just as we all have words, we have some words that we utter, some words that we don't utter, some words we wish we hadn't uttered. <laughs> but uh, we have words and we have the power of those words and we have songs and we have the power of those songs. And we need to grasp the full impact of songs. Well, you know, Moses wrote three songs, at least in our understanding of the Bible. He wrote the song that we referred to after the crossing of the Red Sea. He wrote another song that's recorded in Psalm 90. And he wrote another song at the end of his life as he passed the baton to Joshua at the end of his life to take Israel into the promised land. And those three songs, one was triumph, the one was intercessory, and one was prophetic. And uh, I'd like to go into those songs because they are uh, amazing uh, descriptions of truth, and there's an awful lot in them. But those three songs he wrote, and as you know, we'll, we'll get to sing one of Moses' songs uh, at the end of our days. Well, and you also might be aware that David wrote many, many songs. And his songs really kind of encompass the whole of life. Uh, you know, your journey from through all the tests and trials and triumphs and issues, betrayals, you name it. David was a prolific songwriter. First Chronicles 15, verse 16. It says, David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers to sing joyful songs, except during lockdown. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Sing joyful songs. Sing joyful songs. So there was no occasion where they say, well, okay, uh, we're going to sing blues on this day. We'll sing ragtime and we'll sing, you know, whatever. Uh, no, no, they were to sing joyful songs. Nehemiah 12 and verse 8. Nehemiah 12 verse 8 says, The Levites were Jeshua, Jeshua Benui, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and also Mataniah, who together with the associates was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. Joyful songs, the songs of thanksgiving. you got a song. you got a song. You have a song of joyfulness and a song of thanksgiving. And we know that Solomon, according to the Bible, wrote a thousand and five songs. Now, this was the wisest guy ever walked the earth next to Christ. And he wrote a thousand and five songs. So he obviously had some songs inside of him. And, and probably, you know, that was partially perhaps due to the fact that he came up under David. And here's an interesting fact you may not know. Uh, let me just grab one of my props here, if I can, for a second. Uh Jonah actually uh, wrote a song in the belly of the fish. He did. He wrote a song in the belly of the fish. And you may not be aware of this, but you might ask yourself, how did Jonah write a song in the belly of a fish? Well, he had a Galaxy 9, just like I do. And so he, he has a, there's a little pin in the Galaxy 9, and you, uh, you can take it out and, and just write on the screen. There wasn't a lot of space in the fish, but uh, there was enough for him to get out his Galaxy 9 and write it down because he, he was going to utilize this song uh, uh, later. Well, probably not. <laughs> But the Bible says he wrote a song in the belly of the fish. So if you ever get into the belly of a fish, you can write a song. And 
uh, I think it's, it's fascinating that uh, he wrote this song in the belly of the fish. And immediately after writing this song, the fish vomited him up out onto the dry land and he finished his assignment. Now, there's a lot in that story, and I, I don't, I'm not going to take the time to dig into it, but other than to draw to your attention that when you are in the most confined, restricting, uncomfortable, unclear situations, you can sing a song. You can make, you can make a song. If Jonah can do it, you can do it. So, you know, even the world recognizes the power of song uh, and the power of song to identify with someone's experience, uh, to bring healing or commiseration or alter your focus or, or you know, uh, the world uses songs as what I might call soul therapy. But believers, we, we believe that there is a soul and spirit and circumstantial therapy, so to speak, in song. Because we come to understand that a song releases both internally and externally the presence and the power of God to alter conditions. You know, there are many types of believer songs that are exampled in the Bible. Psalms you can sing in your own language, and they are always songs you can always sing. As, as the Bible says in the New Testament, you can sing songs in the Spirit. You, you don't necessarily know what the words are meaning, but you can sing in tongues. And the Bible says those are songs of praise. The Holy Spirit is singing through you. The Holy Spirit is singing through you. So that's heaven and earth coming together in a song. A song. Think of it. When you sing in tongues, God and man are perfectly joined in magnifying him, singing his praises, and praying at the same time his will to be done. What an amazing power of song. And you know, uh, many years ago when I worked in the hospital, as a young man studying for the ministry, I, I was zealous for the Lord, uh, trying to make sense of my life. And, and uh, I got a job working at the hospital, and I was what they called an orderly. You did a certain degree of patient care. And, and uh, in my particular role, I was assigned to deal with anyone who passed away or anyone who was a particularly troublesome uh, patient in the hospital. So if they had somebody who was difficult, for some reason, they picked on me. I, I don't know why. I don't know. I didn't wear a little badge that says, if you're in trouble, contact me. I didn't. And in fact, I would was the kind of person what I would have kept myself under the radar if I could, but that wasn't my privilege. So one day they, they called and told me that uh, I had to leave my uh, particular group of patients I was assigned to and go to another ward where they had a problem. And so I went to the nursing station and I said, so, so what is the problem? Uh, and they said, well, we have this uh, woman and she's in this particular ward with several other women. We want you to go in there and deal with it. We've all tried to deal with it and uh, we, we, we're just not getting anywhere. Well, I could hear a lot of noise uh, when they were telling me and uh, so they, they gave me a little detail that this woman was uh, 30 stone, and I only say that because that's part of uh, why they couldn't seem to, to do anything medical uh, about the situation. She was there because of a very serious heart condition. She'd had a heart attack, and uh, so there, there wasn't nothing medical they could do for her, but she was disrupting the whole floor, especially those other women who were in the room, and uh, so I just walked down the hall a little bit, and then I could hear here was this woman before I even got in the room was uh, wailing uh, the most high pitched uh, wail you can imagine. It, it, it wasn't uh, like she was crying over something. It was just kind of a high pitched wail 
that didn't really make any sense at all. And it was deafening. I mean, this was a very big woman, so she had big lungs and a big singing capacity. And, and so this, this, this noise, if I could call it that, was coming out of her and uh, distressing everybody. It was distressing to me as I went in and, and I, I kind of realized that the distress I was feeling wasn't just the fact that it was not a comfortable sound, but it, it had another dimension to it. And I, I walked in and I looked at this woman who's lying there in bed and she's the, and the sight of me didn't do anything, but just take it up another notch. And I know some of you would say, we understand that. But anyway, she, she was wailing so loud and nobody could stop her. So I had a thought that came into my mind. And I'm just telling you the story. I'm no significant anything. <laughs> so I sat down next to her bed and I began to sing praises to the Lord. Now, I've never at that point sung a duet. <laughs> It, it was certainly a lopsided one, if you would have called it that. But I sang praises to the Lord. I hadn't been singing more than, say, 30 or 40 seconds. Then all of a sudden, this woman calmed down totally and fell asleep and was never a problem for the rest of the time she was in the hospital. I went out of the room, went to the nursing station. They said, what did you do? And I said, well, uh, I knew what I had to answer was not medical, maybe not logical, sensible. <laughs> and, and I was kind of reluctant to say, I said, well, you know, uh, I couldn't claim it was my great personality <laughs> or my good looks or anything else. I finally, I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what I did. I sang praises to God. And praises to God brought peace to this woman. I want to say to you, the power of your song is greater than you realize. Because songs have the unique ability to change your focus from the negative to the positive, from fear to faith. In Judges chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up. Break out in song. You know, sometimes you can get into this, the stupor, the sleep of a certain kind of condition and you, you, you just, the only way you can wake up and get out of it is to break out in song. I want to say to you, your song is more powerful than you realize. Break out in song. And she did. She did. You know, often God's people can be discouraged and despairing. And they move into a different realm when they begin to sing. You know, sometimes I've observed in my task over time that when people lose a loved one and lots of people around them are trying to love them and bless them, encourage them, say and do kind things and try to be helpful, that it just seems that in their grief, they're, they're kind of locked into a place that nobody can get inside. And it seems like even though you're praying for them and they, they this, this heaviness of grief is upon them. But I've watched healing come to them as perhaps they stood around the graveside and joined with the others and they began to sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Strangely enough, when they began to sing, they began to lift their song to the Lord and to magnify him. Then he 
was magnified. And they begin to come up out of that deep, deep well of grief. Maybe just the first stage of coming up, but they started coming up as, as tears flowed down their face as they magnified him. You know, one of the great hymns of that we uh, in former days sang was It Is Well With My Soul. That was written after the death of a family by the man who experienced the most grief in the loss of his family. It is well with my soul. So a song has the power to alter some things. You know, sometimes you feel powerless, but a song you have can make a difference. You know, it's kind of interesting. There are 15 psalms that are called <coughs> songs or psalms of ascent. That means they are songs that are sung as you're going up to worship. Now, I, I didn't write this. God wrote this. There are songs that are songs that are sung as you're going up to worship. Worship is up. <laughs> Here's a song you sing as you're going up. You're going up. And it has the wonderful, awesome power to move you up. To move you up. And, you know, the Jews took uh, one of these psalms called the Psalms of, a, of Ascent, and they would place the words of this song that were meant to be sung in the same room as a woman who was going through labor and about to give birth to her child. And this song was meant to be a prophetic song and a song of encouragement to her as she was about to bring forth a child. And it was also meant to be a prophetic song that would follow the life journey of the child as they came forth. Now, I find that a fascinating fact from this point of view. There was singing, listen to me now, Christmas just passed, at the birth of the Christ child. Hmm. There was singing at the birth of the Christ child. And there are angels singing all through our life journey. And so we join with the angels while they're singing. And so heaven and earth coming together. And let me tell you, there's a great wedding song that's coming in a future day. So songs have this unique ability to change your focus and to move it away from that which is earthly and demonic and depressing and and shift you spiritually and mentally and emotionally upward. Don't neglect your song. Songs also have the ability to dynamically connect you with the felt presence of God. Psalm 22 and verse 3 in the authorized version says, Thou art holy, O Lord, that inhabits the praises of Israel. God dwells. He, he inhabits the praises of Israel. So when you sing a song of praise, God's presence comes. One of the great truths that came out of the latter rain revival was this verse. As God shone the light of revelation on this verse, a whole movement was totally impacted around the world by this truth. And, and we, we live in the assumption of this truth today. We not only enjoy singing, but we know when we sing to him that his presence comes. And when his presence comes, his power comes because his presence cannot come without his power. He cannot come with his presence without his power. They come together. So when you feel him, the spirit's quickening of your spirit and your emotions and your mind and your body, you're also in touch with the power of God. In that moment. In that moment. We know this in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. You know, Paul and Silas were put in, a, in prison and they, they suffered. 
And Silas got out his ukulele and they began to sing a well-known blues song. Uh, I'd sing it for you. I've written one or two. <laughs> no, they didn't do that. They, they began to sing hymns and praises. They began to sing. This is called a song in the night. Do you sing songs in the night? What, song, what kind of song do you sing? Psalm 149 verse 1 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord. Not just sing. The world sings. But the Bible says sing to the Lord. That little preposition is incredibly powerful. Because it is what takes you into the faith realm when you are singing to one who is invisible, but who is nevertheless real. You have moved into the realm of the supernatural. And you can begin to sense his dynamic presence. It says, sing to the Lord. Songs are also, besides their ability to connect you with God's felt presence, they're part of your sanctuary and arsenal of weapons. Psalm 32 and verse 7. Psalm 32 and verse 7 says, You are my hiding place. You protect me from my troubles and fill me with songs of salvation. Songs of salvation. I want to say to you again, God's given you a song. Have you discovered it? Have you begun to sing it? Is, is it something that's employed as often as your words to speak deliverance and exercise authority and do things in a spiritual realm with the use of words? What about your song? Psalm 40 and verse 3 says, He put a new song in the church. No, he says, he put a new song in my mouth, in your mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see it in fear. He put, it's there, it's there. Don't say it's not there, it is there. But pastor, I'm not a great singer. Oh, it doesn't matter whether your melodic ability or your ability to keep a tune or stay on pitch or whatever makes everybody else happy. God put a song there. You don't have to be a soloist to sing your song. You can just sing, sing to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 19 says, sing. This is a command. This is not a, well, if you think you can. No, he says, sing and make, create music. You create music. So let me encourage you. You can apply this message today by just starting with a psalm of Scripture whether it's Psalm 23 or Psalm 46, and just sing it to your, your own made-up tune. And just as you begin to prime the pump of your song-making ability, the songs then will begin to rise more and more, especially if you're taking in and singing and you're having worship in your home and, and you're, you're letting the, the songs that have been recorded fill the atmosphere and you're, you're having this. The song begins to be more a part of your life. What song are you going to be singing? in 2021 blues rap garage alternative hip-hop crossover grunge indie rock art punk hellbilly i didn't even know there was such a genre as hellbilly songs but there are in fact there are thousands of different genres of songs besides hillbilly and hellbilly thousands but let me tell you something that perhaps you may not have known. The song of this world is called the song, listen to this now, of the prostitute. The song of this world is called the song of the prostitute. So let me just kind of put the whole global thing together. There's a song of the bridegroom. Revelation says that in the midst of the congregation, the bridegroom sings. There is a song of the bride, and there's the song of the prostitute, the whore. 
the whore. The song of this world draws people in a million ways to intimacy with evil. That's called the song of the prostitute. Only two kinds of songs in terms of right and wrong. The song of the redeemed and the song of the prostitute. Isaiah 23, 15 to 18 talks about it. And I, that's just a little seed I don't have time to develop today. But I just want you to put that in perspective because a lot of times Christians may try to kind of bring some relief to their soul by singing songs that they heard in the world or they know from the world. And, you know, new songs come out all the time. Where do they come from? Source has a fundamental value in determining whether a song is from one realm or the other. Song of the prostitute. You know, I, you know, like everybody else, when I was a boy, I listened to radio. I, I, I heard a lot of songs and, and, you know, you just hear them enough to where they stay inside of you. So even as an adult, something will happen and I'll, I'll say, oh, it reminds me of an old song that I, that I heard as a boy. I'm not talking about hymns now, Christian songs. I'm talking about really what I didn't understand then was the song of the prostitute. It, it had a great melody. I mean, you know, Satan doesn't package stuff that looks ugly and despicable and, and uncomfortable and you don't like it and you hate it, but you just, no, no. It, there is something that has an appeal. It has an identification. Amazing. And this message today is only scratching the surface on the power of a song. But I want to encourage you in 2021, make sure you're singing a song. You're singing the new song. You're singing the song of the redeemed. You're singing the song of the bride. Especially right now today, if you're in some difficult frustrating or discouraging circumstance, I'd like to encourage you to follow the command of Scripture and begin to sing a new song to the Lord. And as you do, as you sing a new song to the Lord, a song of praise, and begin to thank Him for your salvation and for the wonderful things He's done, the times He's supplied your needs and healed your body and helped your family, and, and just, just let your song arise, a song that you make and create, the words and the tune, let, let that song rise. As you take this admonition today and sing your song, God will begin to work not only in you, but from you in ways you can't imagine. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you've given us something so wonderful, so good, so powerful. Something that is a portion of yourself. You said that the angels of the morning sang songs in creation. They sang. So everything that you make sings. May we join with the angels, with you, and sing, sing. Thank you, Lord, today that as those who have heard this message today begin to take it to heart and sing as they release into the atmosphere the mighty power that broke Paul and Silas out of prison, Lord, that destroyed all the enemies of Israel under Jehoshaphat as the power of the song was released as they began to sing and praise, your word says, as they did, as they did. Thank you, Lord, for that song that you put. Thank you that healings and reconciliations and provisions and Lord, comfort begin today in your people as they sing, as they sing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me encourage you. There are some uh, songs that are on a song list. If you don't have it, we'll send it to you that you can join with. 
and they, they all come up on the internet with the words. And you can use these songs. There are many songs you can sing. But I, I've kind of selected these songs because they're, they're very much simple songs uh, in which your heart can find expression. And then you can move off of off piste, so to speak, and, and begin to sing your own song as you worship the Lord throughout this week. This lets your song rise to the Lord. In Jesus' name, God bless you.